MSF teams are facing an unprecedented phenomenon, with an outbreak of Ebola now hitting several areas, from the southeast of the country to the capital city, Conakry. Five towns are affected. We are facing an epidemic of unprecedented magnitude in terms of the distribution of cases in the country. The virus has been reported in Zerekore, Masenta, Kisidugu, Gekedu and now in Conakry. And there may well be cases in other towns. This makes our job even more difficult. Previous outbreaks were concentrated in a smaller geographic area. Infected people's body secretions, particularly saliva, blood and vomit, transmit the virus, so the medical team's priority is to isolate patients. There is no vaccine or treatment to combat the Ebola virus, and contamination can occur even after a patient's death. We're the only people in physical contact with the patients, so we try to touch them a lot, as they are very lonely there. They have no physical contact with anyone. It's very difficult. Symptoms appear after an incubation period lasting anything from a few days to three weeks and include a temperature, extreme weakness, vomiting and diarrhea, and sometimes internal and external hemorrhaging. MSF teams are working in three locations in Guinea, isolating patients and anyone around them who may be infected. They are also building or adapting inpatient facilities. <laughs> this is Kano Hospital at the end of 2011. The health situation is desperate. Diarrheas, respiratory infections and malaria kill 35 children every day. This is Kano two years later and the situation is even worse. A major humanitarian emergency is now compounded by conflict with dire consequences for the people. So what's happened in the past year? A succession of particularly harrowing events characterized by tensions, fighting between armed groups and inter-community, inter-ethnic and religious conflict. We've seen patients, including women and children, with injuries attesting to an unbearable and overwhelming thirst to kill. The teams in the field, as well as myself, we've been shocked to the core. In a report published on the 19th of March, MSF denounced a year of escalating violence. Abuses committed by Seleka rebels during their offensive and taking of power in 2013. And in retaliation, the attack on Bongi by anti-Balaka forces in December 13 and the atrocities committed against Muslims associated with the former Seleka rebels and their subsequent mass exodus to neighbouring countries. The chaos, further exacerbated by banditry, now affects everyone, in Bongi and throughout the country. We now find ourselves in a quite improbable situation in many parts of the country, with people enclaved and protected by the French military operation Sangaris or African Union MISCA, and then surrounded by the anti-Balaka. There's an attempt to disarm, but it's only half working. And what we see, for example, in Carnot, are men getting killed as soon as they leave the protection of the church compound. There is nothing as yet to suggest that the situation is going to improve. The emergency continues, as we saw during the wave of violent clashes in Bongi at the end of March. In just two days, MSF treated around 30 casualties. Four were children and 16 were women. It's a conflict that looks set to last. It has displaced several hundreds of thousands of people who now live in camps throughout South Sudan, like here in the capital city Juba, where 25,000 displaced people are crowded into Tomping camp. Living conditions are already wholly unacceptable and will quickly get worse as the rainy season sets in. But these people aren't thinking of going back home. At least here, the displaced are able to receive some assistance and have a degree of security. Elsewhere in the country, the fighting continues, and the rainy season will further complicate the delivery of aid, which is already all too insufficient. 
Some South Sudanese have decided to flee even further and have crossed the border into Uganda. Because of the ongoing conflicts in Sudan, people come from the border and they come to Ajumani. When they come from Sudan, they are put in the reception center. After like a week, they are settled in camps. 55,000 refugees are already registered here, and there are over 100 new arrivals every day. MSF works in the transit camp and three permanent camps, managing water supply and delivering medical treatment. The organization has also opened a hospital and a maternity unit and provides treatment to malnourished children close to the camps in Zaipi. Twenty years ago, the MSF team in Kigali saw the town descend into violence. These were the first days of what would go on to become known as genocide. The team tried to help the victims, but were quickly overwhelmed by the task. On the 13th of April, an MSF surgical team, working in partnership with the International Committee of the Red Cross, arrived to relieve them. We decided to work together and set up a field hospital. As we went through militia checkpoints, we would be told there was no point in us doing what we were doing, as they were planning to kill all the Tutsis anyway. In reality, it was impossible to transport adult males. MSF carried on working in many parts of the country for months. The organization's humanitarian principles were often violated by the perpetrators of the genocide who had no hesitation in pursuing their murderous onslaughts inside medical facilities, targeting patients and health workers. Humanitarian aid was regularly diverted for criminal purposes, for killing people. It was patently obvious during the genocide. Safe havens became slaughterhouses, and hospitals and churches where people would expect shelter and protection were quite the contrary, the first places where they would be executed. Twenty years on, the teams are still deeply affected by the events they witnessed in Rwanda. We lost at least 200 Rwandan colleagues just during the genocide. They were murdered. We were so aghast at the sheer size of what was happening, how extreme it all was, that we, as an organization, didn't always do what we should have done to help our colleagues get away. The medical teams found themselves constantly in the face of horror, when they realized that the killings were in fact the premeditated extermination of a whole group of people, they perceived the limits of humanitarian action more clearly than ever before. For the one and only time in its history, MSF made a public demand for armed intervention, pointing out a very simple truth. Doctors can't stop genocide. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, around three million people have been forced out of their homes. Some live with host families, some in camps, while others hide in the bush. Many of the displaced have dropped out of sight and are thus deprived of state-provided services and humanitarian aid. Augustine fled with his wife and seven children and came to Walikale in North Kivu. We were forced to carry each other on our backs like safari ants. The eldest carry the little ones. I carry one, their mother carries the other. The pace isn't the same. That's how I got here. On March the 3rd, Médecins Sans Frontières published a report denouncing the silent suffering of the Congolese people. The situation in the east of the country is giving even more cause for concern, as the most vulnerable are deprived of the medical care they so desperately need. As I speak, there are many women, victims of rape, who are pregnant and are due to give birth. Many come to hospital very late because they stay at home too long, unable to raise enough money for treatment. MSF's report features medical data and patient and health worker stories assembled during its many years in the region. The organization has called for immediate action to put an end to the suffering of the Congolese people. <laughs> the
The high prevalence of tuberculosis in Cambodia is pushing MSF to innovate. New screening methods and treatments must be found if there's to be any chance of curbing the spread of the disease. Big majority of the, of the TB patients, pe people with active TB inside, they are not identified by the existing system. And the existing system reach its limit. So now we need to find new mechanism, new system uh, to identify this, all these person, all these patients who have an active TB but who are no symptom, who are not identified by the, the health, existing health system. The team has set up a pilot active case finding program. Rather than waiting for people already presenting symptoms of TB to go to the hospital for screening, this initiative involves staff actively seeking out infected people in at-risk groups. Over 55-year-olds, for example. We have two outreach workers who go into the community and they sensitize the community. They explain what the, what the activity is, they explain that it has no cost, they explain how it's going to be carried out, how they're going to be transported, and answer questions. They distribute leaflets to assure people and give feedback at a second level and then the people are transported here to the site. At the hospital they have a chest x-ray and a medical consultation. Whenever TB is suspected, a sputum sample is taken for testing. Although preliminary results show that the number of TB cases identified by the teams has doubled, many people continue to slip through the net like stallholders who don't take the time to go for screening. MSF outreach teams are focusing their efforts on such people to ensure that everyone who needs it gets access to treatment.